All right, well, good evening, everybody, and happy Friday. I want to say hello to everybody that's watching online. Uh, thank you again for coming back to the second part of our six-part series on the Book of Romans. Now, I know last week's sermon was, it was a little bit harder. Uh, it was a little darker than a lot of sermons you're hearing in different churches throughout the country, but God asks us, He commands us, those of us that, that teach the Word, he, God commands us to preach the truth, and sometimes the truth hurts, so I'm not sorry about teaching you guys about the truth. Let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 2. Uh, we're going to start there. We left off there last week. We're going to start there again this week, and I'm going to do something that I normally don't do in sermons, but I'm going to do it this week. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use a real person as a sermon illustration. Normally, I don't use real people as, or at least their names, as illustrations in my sermons, because the last thing I want to do is hurt people's feelings. But I struggle with celebrity pastors. So I don't think it's outside the realm of possibilities that one of them might show up in my sermon. Now, most of you know that I'm not a huge fan of Joel Olstein, And it's not because of his pearly white smile. I'm not anti-smile. See? I have a smile. It's not because he's ultra-positive and he wants to teach people about the blessings of God and being positive and being blessed by God. Again, I'm not over... I'm not against people being positive and people being blessed. But what makes Joel Olstein's consistent message so deceptively dangerous is that he refuses to acknowledge and to teach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. He doesn't make it obvious that the good news of God confronts the bad news of man. You see, if all you ever have is good news, then you don't really have good news. You have, well, news. What makes it good and what makes it good news is when it's compared and contrasted to bad news. Bad news is kind of the black velvet background of good news. So, for example, here's a quote from old Joel. Uh, it kind of gets to the root of what I'm talking about here. He says, in dealing with people for several years, thousands of people, one thing I can tell you is that 99.9% .9 of people are not bad people. They make poor choices, but deep down, they've got a good heart. Now, I, I want to believe that, don't you? I mean, I really want to believe that. In fact, if I didn't believe the Bible to be true, I would believe that statement. The only problem with it is it's not true. The reason it's not true is because, not because I don't agree with it or agree with the person that said it, because what I think doesn't matter. It's not true because God, who is the standard and the declarer of all things true, says it's not true. This is what God says about people. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Romans 3, 10. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. God says, the, he says the very opposite of what Joel Olstein says. Joel believes that 99% of people have a good heart. God knows that 100% of the people have a corrupt heart. So the question isn't, which do you prefer? The question is, who are you going to believe? And unfortunately, thousands and thousands of Olstein listeners believe him and not God. Now, today's not exposed Joel Olstein Day. We're going to save that for another occasion. I've got party hats. We're going to have cake. We'll drink coffee. It'll be a good time, but we're not going to talk about that today. Here's my point. If we truly believe the vast majority of people are intrinsically good, 
then we only need to teach and preach things that focus on what we feel feels good and what brings good. Because eventually the good message is going to connect with the good of the human heart and BAM! Good things, or more importantly, God things, are going to happen. But if this is the correct model of preaching and teaching the gospel, we're going to have to take the whole book of Romans, just have to throw it right out. Because honestly, it's not overflowing with the abundance that we would expect of feel-good verses about the state of humanity. Now, if you weren't with us in the beginning of our study of Romans, go back and watch the video from last week. Um, it's a fantastic preacher. I know the guy. He's great. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to do a little bit of catch-up for us. Uh, the book of Romans is a letter. It was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. There's this crisis or some kind of a thing going on with the church in Rome, and there's a division between the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, and it's caused this division and this disunity in the church. Now, Paul hasn't been to Rome yet, so he hasn't met most of the Christians that have comprised the Roman church. He wants to write a letter, uh, he wants to write this letter of encouragement uh, that leads them through their struggles but he's hoping that he can get there in person, but he wants this letter to reach them first to at least get them through what they're going through. So in the meantime, what could Paul write that's going to bring light to the issues of what's going on and could help heal the rift of what's going on between the Jews and the Gentiles in the church in Rome? Well, you know, Paul doesn't write this letter, this positive letter, emphasizing staying positive and trusting in the good-heartedness of human beings and in mankind. He doesn't even point out who's right. He doesn't point out who's wrong. And he certainly doesn't point out how he thinks that the church should be proceeding. So what does he do? Paul writes this letter that focuses singularly on the gospel of God. Why? Because he doesn't know who in the church is truly saved and who isn't. He doesn't know who's full of God's spirit and who isn't. He doesn't know who understands the intricacies and the, of the gospel and who doesn't. Most of the problems in the church are not behavior problems, they're belief problems. And over time, wrong beliefs are going to reveal themselves through wrong behaviors. I'm going to say that again. Over time, wrong beliefs are going to reveal themselves through wrong behaviors. You can hide them for a while, guys, but you can't hide them forever. The outward behaviors of the Roman church show that their inward beliefs need to be addressed. So Paul takes dead aim. He takes dead aim on the understanding that they have of the gospel. Basically, essentially, what he's saying is if you really understand the gospel, you wouldn't be having these issues loving and accepting each other. Church depends on gospel clarity. Then gospel clarity enhances and strengthens church unity. I'm going to say that again, too. Church unity depends on gospel clarity. Then gospel clarity strengthens church unity. Woo! Did you hear that? Yeah. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, is the thesis statement for the book of Romans. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. Gospel. Gospel means good news. This letter, it details the good news of God for the salvation of the world. But here's the crazy thing, though. You'd think that Paul would immediately launch into explaining how, this, how good this good news is and how you could get it. But he doesn't do that. No, he doesn't do that. 
He spends the rest of chapter one, all of chapter two, and most of chapter three extensively talking about sin and the lostness of man and the wrath and the judgment of God. Why? Well, because if you're going to receive the right cure, you have to get the right diagnosis. Before your GPS can tell you where you need to go, it, you have to know what location you're at. So the good news of God only becomes good news to you when you understand why you desperately need it and how to humbly receive it. With every good gospel presentation, there's a definitive orange. First comes the warning of danger, and then there comes a way of escape. First comes the message of condemnation, then an offer of forgiveness. First comes the bad news of guilt, then the good news of grace. The whole message and the whole purpose of the loving, redeeming grace that God offered through Jesus Christ rests upon the reality of man's universal guilt, rejecting and abandoning God. And because of it, we're under his sentence of eternal condemnation and death. Paul knows that people who refuse to believe, they're, they're lost, and they're never going to surrender their life to God who came to find them. The beauty of the good news must be held in stark contrast to the severity of the bad news. Chapter 1, chapter 1 ends with Paul declaring that God's wrath and judgment are upon an unrepentant sinner everywhere. It's in verse 28 through 32, look it up. Now, Paul, Paul's like every good lawyer. He anticipates what many in the church are going what, what the church goes in Rome are going to probably think uh, and what they're probably going to say in the response to Paul's argument. You know, Paul imagines these churchgoers and they're, they're hearing this letter and they're going to stand to their feet and they're going to start clapping their hands and they're going to give this heart. Amen, Paul. Brother, you tell them, you're so right, Paul. Those dirty, rotten sinners, they deserve the wrath and the judgment of God. It's about time somebody stood up and told them that they're the problem in this sick and twisted world. You give it to them, Paul. Woo! But I want you to see how quickly Paul turns the tables on these people. In chapter 1, Paul consistently uses the pronoun they. He uses it in verse 28, 29, 31. Check it out for yourselves if you want to. But what's the first word in chapter 2? The first word in chapter 2 is you. The sweeping warning of God's wrath and judgment on sin and sinners in chapter 1 goes directly to a personal warning throughout chapter 2. Chapter 1, Paul says, the judgment of God awaits all the obvious sinners of the world. And in chapter 2, Paul says the judgment of God also awaits the not-so-obvious sinners. The ones that are sitting in the church hiding under the cloak of, an, of outward moralism and what one of the people that I find extremely entertaining, what Phil Robertson would call religiosity. Paul is uncovering and exposing a major problem that was in the church then and one that's in the church now. Hypocrisy. Christian author Brennan Manning famously said, and I quote, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelievable world finds unbelievable. Hypocrites in the church condemn sins of others publicly, all while doing a lot of the same sins privately. These same hypocrites, they have somehow convinced themselves that they're, they're immune to the consequences and not, of not truly surrendering to the lordship of Jesus Christ 
and not living this obedient lifestyle to the Word of God. And Paul shocks these hypocrites when he says, God loves you, but he's ready to judge you. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to have you guys go through and read Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 16. But through those chapters, Paul makes four statements, four sweeping statements, very clear about the judgment of God on sinners. God loves people, but his judgment of all people is indisputable. Number one, Romans 2, 1 through 2 says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. We've heard this language before of people being without excuse, haven't we? We heard that back in chapter 1, verse 20. Even if nobody has told them about God, people know because God has made himself known through creation. Religious hypocrites, they've got no excuse before God on Judgment Day because they show not only did they know that there was a God, they knew right from wrong and when, when they condemned other people for their sinful actions. Yet they secretly did those actions in private. At first, Paul's blanket indictment that some, of, basically that some of them do some sinful things just as they listed that the heathens were doing, those are easy to dismiss. I don't practice those things. No way, Paul. I don't, you don't dare practice those things. But let's be honest. Let's just be honest for a minute. Most of us have three moral categories that we put people in. Number one, the super bad people. People like Adolf Hitler, Charles Manson, Judas Iscariot, Nero. Most people are going to agree these are bad dudes. Really, really evil dudes. Then we've got the uber good people. People like Mother Teresa and Billy Graham. Uh, these people are usually described as the epitome of good people. They're the example that we strive to be like here on Earth. And then there's the middle of the road people. They're somewhat good, yet sometimes they're bad. In a way, these are kind of the to-be-determined people. And we typically put ourselves in that category. What do you think, who do you think, the measuring stick for that category of people is. Yeah. We use ourselves as the measuring stick. We're the yardstick. We use ourselves as a standard. For example, we're driving down the highway, and you have people that are going a lot slower than us. They're jerks. They're idiots. And they need to get out of our way. The people that are driving faster than us, they are clearly menaces to society, and they shouldn't be allowed on the roads. When most unsaved people are asked whether they think they're going to go to heaven or they're going to go to hell, many of them answer, well, I'm not perfect, but I haven't killed anyone, so I think I'm a pretty good person. We tend to uh, find a way to compare ourselves to other people who don't measure up to our standard of good to make ourselves feel better about the lives that we're living. Fun fact for you. Did you know in prisons, murderers, rapists, uh, other hardened criminals have absolutely no problem whatsoever mistreating and even killing child molesters? Why is that? Because when they compare themselves to child molesters, they feel superior. We all say that we want justice in the world, but the truth is we, we carry a standard of righteousness based on our perceived goodness. We'll tolerate only so much evil in the world as long as, it's, as long as we can accept that within ourselves. When people are worse or more sinful than we perceive ourselves to be, that's when we get indignant, and that's when we start demanding justice. 
when we get upset that God doesn't remove all the evil in the world, we forget that that would require him to remove us too. What we really mean is, Lord, please get rid of all the evil in the world that is worse than what's inside of me. But here, here Paul says God's judgment isn't like our judgment of us. Our standard of judging us is other people. God's standard of judging us is the truth. Verse 2. Verse 2 says, Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. Now I've said this many times. The truth is not a principle. Truth is a person. Jesus said that I am the truth, the life, and the way. When it comes to final judgment of people, we are going to be compared to the perfect standard that is Jesus Christ. There's no one, no one, that's going to come even close to that standard. But that's why Paul tells us in chapter 3, all have fallen, all have sinned, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Every single person is going to be held to the same standard on Judgment Day, the perfection of Jesus. And it's an indisputable fact that we all fall short. But what religious hypocrites feel and what they've done is they've convinced themselves that they don't fall as short as other people. So maybe, just maybe, God will cut them a break. Now let me ask you this. We, we all get lined up on the edge of the Grand Canyon, right? We're standing there with our toes on the edge, and somebody puts a gun to our back of our head and says, you can live if you can jump to the other side. Now, is it going to matter that some of us can jump five feet and some of us can only jump three feet? No, it's not going to matter because, honestly, the result's going to be the same. We're all going to die because none of us can jump across the Grand Canyon. This is what Paul is getting at here. The judgment of God will fall upon every person, and the standard by which all of us are compared is the same. It's the absolute perfection of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter how much better you think you are of other people. You and I fall way, way short. It's undeniable. It's indisputable. The judgment of God is indisputable. God loves people, but his judgment of all people is inescapable. Romans 2, 3, and 4. When you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent? I want you to focus your attention on a word that's found twice in verse 4, okay? Translated through the NLT, which is what I read, it's kindness. Other versions translated as goodness. It's not that God is good as opposed to being bad. It's that he's good in the sense of being an extremely kind and benevolent God towards undeserving sinners. Its equivalent in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word cheese it. And yeah, I had to look that up because honestly, cheese it sounds like something you put on the on the on the warm, tasty bread, but not cheese it, which most often is translated into loving kindness. God possesses this innate loving kindness, generosity, mercy, compassion, patience, and kindness. And it's demonstrated in his loving kindness. And it's demonstrated in that loving kindness towards us. And it's that reason, it's one of those reasons that we're encouraged by Scripture to worship our generous God. Psalms 23 and 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Psalm 107 and 8 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Psalms 145, 3 and 4 and 7 and 9 says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commands your work to commends your work to another. They tell you, they tell of your mighty acts. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and gracious and compassionate, 
slow to anger and rich to love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. You can't worship God and leave out his goodness, and his kindness, and his generosity, his benevolence, his mercy, and his love. You just can't. It's this goodness and kindness of God that Paul refers to in verse 4. But don't miss this. Notice what is surrounding that incredible truth. All of this good news is surrounded by what? All of this bad news. All of this wonderful truth is surrounded by God's judgment. There's people inside and outside the church who consistently balk at the idea and the concept of a loving God who showers incredible blessings on people day after day after day and then will one day run out of patience and will judge and punish those who refuse to turn from their sin and trust in Christ Jesus as their Redeemer and as their Savior. But this is exactly what Paul is saying. He says you you're taking for granted the kindness and the goodness of God, not realizing that it's intended not to make you feel good, but it's intended to bring you to repentance. God's kindness has two components, okay? First is forbearance. It's a tolerance or a truce, okay? It's the absence of hostility because his kindness and his goodness, God holds back his anger and continues to bless undeserving sinners. Then there's patience. Man, God is a patient God. It's this long-suffering patience with people. He's a kind and he's a good God. He's benevolent with sinners for a long, long time. He holds back his hostility and his wrath for a long time, guys. If all God was was justice, long ago he would have taken us and he would have wiped out humankind from the face of the earth. He would have just taken his hand and he would have wiped it out just like he did with the flood. But not before patience. For hundreds of years and 120 years of a preacher that preached the righteous word named Noah. Noah warned people of their sins for 120 years. God is by nature good and kind. He's giving and he gives benefits to sinners. This is called common grace. God makes the sun shine and he makes the rain fall on the just and the unjust. He has tolerance, which means he holds off on the justice of sinners and he holds off the justice that they deserve. And he does the, both of these things for a long period of time. Nehemiah 9 and 17 says, uh, it puts it this way, he is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Now, every time there's a major catastrophe and people die, you hear the question, why would God allow this to happen? Where was God? Why would this be allowed to happen? If God is so loving and he's so full of grace, why would God let this happen? You see, we see the cataclysmic judgment of God every once in a while. And when people see it, they conclude that this must mean that God is harsh. That God's without mercy and without kindness. And that, that is so far from the truth. The truth is that we're all sinners, and all sinners perish. And sinners that perish in that disaster, they should have perished long before, right? The wages of sin are what? Death. We all should be dead after one sin. The fact that any of us live beyond the first time that we ever sin is purely the mercy and grace of God. God has every reason to wipe us out. Every reason to wipe out the whole human race. But he doesn't. 
His goodness and His patience with us cause Him to bring positive blessings into the lives of sinners and with, to withhold His judgment for the purpose of bringing us to Him through the repentance and through faith in Jesus Christ. But sinners get used to God's goodness. They become comfortable in His kindness and in His grace. And all they can see is something that appears to be an unjust act. And it's way too severe. The reason we, can, we feel God is cruel and unjust is because we don't understand how sinful we really are. And it's because we're unwilling to come to the provision that he's made to rescue us from his justice. Namely, the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the cross that he died and then he rose again. Sin should produce death. Instantaneous death. God said to Adam, in the day that you eat, you will die. Every moment we live after that first sin is pure kindness and goodness from God. God doesn't owe us life. Any sin brings death, and death can come at any moment. God gives us life freely. And he does that through his kindness and in the face of man's ultimate treason. And he has every right at any point to take it back. But God, God is so kind and he's so merciful that he sent his son into this world to take the punishment for you and I. So we could turn from sin and turn to him. He's patient, but he's provided more than just patient. He provided us a sacrifice, too. And we're so used to mercy, so used to sinning and getting away with it, so used to sinning without instantaneous punishment, so accustomed to abusing grace and goodness and kindness of God, that when justice does appear, we think it's injustice. We're offended. We get triggered. If God isn't merciful because we don't understand what it is that we deserve. There are many times when his mercy runs out. My spirit will not always strive with man, he said. I'm not going to do this forever. And then he brought the flood. Paul says, you know, yeah, God's loving and kind and gracious and patient, but... When you accept and you live in that kindness and you live in that goodness but you don't surrender to God you're showing contempt for that goodness and kindness. You mock it. You despise it. You make light of it. Galileans, Jews from the north, uh, they'd come to Jerusalem. Uh, they were there to offer sacrifices in the temple and while they were worshiping God, Pilate's soldiers come, and they cut him straight down. So the question was, why does this happen? How can this tragedy be explained? This is in Luke chapter 13, verse 1, by the way. So Jesus answers and says, Do you suppose that the Galileans that were, were slain were worse sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered death. Did these people die because they were worse than anybody else? Are people who die in tsunamis worse than the people that don't? Are people that die of COVID any worse than people who get it and don't die? Is that what we're saying here? The people who are alive are just a lot better than the people that die. No. That's not what we're saying. And Jesus says no to. He's in verse 3, he says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Wow. What he says is, you're going to die too. And you don't know when, but you're going to die. So you better get ready. Well, how do you get ready? You repent. 
We went over that last week. And if you don't, you're not just going to die a sad death, you're going to suffer a miserable eternity. You're living on borrowed time. We all are. You, but you're living under mercy and extended kindness and goodness from an infinitely holy God. He can't tolerate sin, but he tolerates sinners for a limited time. His willingness to wait on you and even bless you till your repentance is an act of incredible and divine kindness and goodness. Immediately following, Jesus brings up another similar current event that people back then would know about. In verse 4, he says, Or those 18 who the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than any other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? He's asking if people that got killed in this tragic accident when, when a tower fell, were they worse sinners than the people that survived it? Again, Jesus answers, no. Verse 5, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Whenever there's a disaster, whenever there's tragic, unexplainable death of any degree, the message is always the same. You're going to die too. So you better wake up and you better get ready. You better repent. We all live under the extension of God's goodness and mercy. It's meant to lead us to repentance. But often we allow it to lead us to this entitlement mentality. And when we see the justice of God enacted, we're blind and we think it's injustice. God may not bring the wrath immediately, but he will bring his wrath ultimately. His judgment's inescapable. There's only one hope and one way of escape. Come to Christ. Come to the cross. Embrace a Savior that died for you in your place. God offers forgiveness of sin. He wipes your slate clean. And he doesn't remember your sin anymore. So as we close this week, I want you to listen to this. Psalm 86 and 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and, and abundant in your loving kindness to all who call upon you. So call upon the Lord. Ask him to forgive you through the provision of Christ on your behalf at the cross. Well, thank you for supporting the ministry of Victory Biker Church, Maine. Uh, until next week, remember, Jesus loves you. I love you, and there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Have a great night, guys.